I helped out with the business for about three months and there might be a good lesson or some wisdom in this as well. Um, I worked for free for, mm -hmm. for three months, two to three months. Didn't, uh, didn't ask for a thing. I wasn't expecting anything out of it. Um, it was just my, my passion for, for this stuff. And, um, I thought it was really neat that, you know, we can take the, the nutritional power of these organs and we can put them in a very convenient capsule and, and people can get them like shipped to their home. You know, it's, it's really hard if you try to go get like brain or testicle, like it's not accessible. So I was just happy to be a part of it. Morning. Welcome back to the show, friend. Today, I'm sitting with Dean Brennan, who is the CEO over here at Heart and Soil. This is a really cool chat to hear all about these life lessons and leadership lessons of leading a pretty radical company, Heart and Soil. We get into what was Dean's story, his health story, his personal story, which was uh, an inspiration and moving away from ulcerative colitis in his college days into a flirtation with veganism and coming full circle into healing his journey with an animal-based diet and then stumbling into Paul Saladino and starting this crazy company that we've all come to know and love called Heart and Soil. We talk about all kinds of things, life lessons, becoming a father, what you can learn from leadership and what it's really like to follow your purpose and take some brave leaps of faith. And then of course, Dean and I chat with some of our callers. We talk about some issues of over-repetitive injuries, our pitcher's shoulder, some things that you can do to manage that from a movement and mobility perspective, sleep and restoration, as well as targeted supplementation and lifestyle hacks. And then last but not least, we speak to a mother of a son who has been dealing with some conditions, gut irritation, autoimmune for a long time, who is healing those, feeling radical, and wants to spread this message as much as possible. And it's just a really cool and inspiring conversation across the board. So without further ado, let's chat to the CEO of Heart and Soil, Mr. Dean Brennan. Hello, beautiful people of radical health seeking world. How are you today? I am joined by the chief operator, the chief energy officer, the CEO himself, Mr. Dean Brennan of Heart and Soil, the head of the helm. How are you doing, mate? It's good to sit down with you. I'm doing great, Steve. Thanks. Uh, well, I would say thanks for having me, but yeah, I'm here at HQ at Heart and Soil. Um, it's my first podcast I've ever been on, so Let's I'm pretty go. excited to hit the pavement. And go. Let's go. I should yeah. be the one saying thanks for having me because actually, if it wasn't for you, this probably wouldn't be happening, but certainly I wouldn't be sitting in this seat because we've had a relationship that's been developing over the past seven or so years when we first crossed paths at Paleo FX back in 2017-ish and we had a conversation and you do the whole follow each other on Instagram, keep tabs on each other. At that time, he was in a very different world. I was in a very different world, but we both had this connecting passion of primal health. We were both PHCIs, which is the uh, really cool full circle moment for both of us in the studio yesterday, we had Mark Sisson on and that episode will have already aired. So please go and watch that because Mark is a legend, but we both went through his training course. We connected at Paleo FX at the Primal booth. We chatted, we kept tabs on each other. The next year, the, the relationship developed a little bit more. And since then, I've been able to kind of go away and keep tabs on what you're up to. And a couple of years ago, I saw on your story, like, what's What's he doing here, hanging out with Saladino? And then the heart and soil thing starts emerging and lo and behold, conversations happen and you reach out to me about doing a podcast and you know, graciously offering me of all people to sit here. So I owe a huge debt of gratitude to you, man, and everybody at the team here for, for everything that you do. So thank you and welcome yeah. to the podcast. It's, uh, it's good to have you. What is, um, what, what is that story for you? You know, the whole, you've got a personal story, you've got a story of how you got involved with heart and soil. Where do you want to start with that? What's uh, coming out for you? Oh, man. I think I'll start with like keeping tabs on you over that time period. It might have been more like stalking because <laughs> your content is excellent. And uh, out of everyone I follow on Instagram, um, you, you are one of maybe three accounts that I watch almost every story, paid attention to. Um, you're brilliant. I thought that from the minute that we met. And it's kind of crazy. We've had so many full circle mm -hmm. moments here, uh, specifically with Heart and Soil. I think it was like around 2020 when I started at Heart and Soil. I knew that this would be a, a new journey mm -hmm. for me. 
but I didn't realize uh, there's a guy at Hartsville that likes the word uh, serendipitous. Mm-hmm. But there's been a lot of these full circle moments. Um, we have a few people on the team. Uh, Kate, actually, who's one of the podcast producers sitting right over there. He's the one making us um, all look very good behind yeah, the lens. We, you know, I met his dad at Palo FX through the Primal Health Coach uh, program. I met you there. Um, met Mark Sisson. I did a little work for Primal uh, Kitchen mm-hmm. for a while. Um, I actually met Paul at Palo FX. Oh, no way. I didn't know that. Yeah, in 2018. Um, so anyway, just want to make mention of that. You're, uh, you've added an, a ton of value to my life. So I mean, when we you know, started Heart and Soil and got things going, I was kind of always thinking like, man, Steve, he's brilliant. He's doing all the good stuff in the world. You know, you're in it for the right reasons. And I uh, always thought that maybe you'd crush it at a podcast. So it's cool to be sitting here. I appreciate that, man. It's, uh, it's, it's nice to have that reflected, you know, because I've been solopreneur and on the health space for a long time. And it, it's a good reminder that you never quite know who's watching, you know, so for any aspiring content creators out there, like really cool people could be watching you just share yourself authentically and put out good content into the world that leaves people better than you found them. And who knows what happens because of that? Because there's a, an amazing syn- synchronicity or serendipitous moment. And now we're sitting here, you know, doing this thing and trying to just kind of spread more of the message. So what what's really like the overarching I guess the why with the podcast from your perspective as the as the leader at the helm here what was the uh, when did these conversations start about like maybe we should do a podcast and what's kind of the the motivation behind doing that yeah good question so I think part of the makeup of heart and soil like part of our mission is to guide and inspire people to radical health now there's a lot of inspirational stuff out there um, we do a lot of really great stuff from an inspirational st- standpoint um, but there's this other part of the practical application. Mm. Um, how do you actually put this stuff into motion? And there's, I just don't think there's a lot of great resources out there. And I wanted to do something where we're talking to real people. Mm. Um, I'll actually tell you where I kind of had this epiphany. I spent a, lo- spent a lot of time years ago watching uh, Dave Ramsey and, mm-hmm. and listening to him give practical finance uh, advice to people. And he had a really brilliant framework on how he walked people through the steps and he's changed millions of lives, you know, in that area, in the area of financial peace. And from my health journey and what I have witnessed in others through the little bit of coaching that I've done in the past, a lot of times um, there's a lot of mental barriers at play and it's not necessarily a matter of education or knowledge. And now that's some of it. Obviously we have a lot of work to do just at a macro level, mm. you know, in the United States and those areas. But um, I felt like we had an opportunity here to do something a little bit different, to talk to real people and give practical guidance and advice and, and really help people put some of this stuff into their daily lives, build good habits, mm. give them tools to make good decisions. And uh, my thought is if if someone can go through these seven steps and, and really take them seriously and educate themselves and try to get better every single day, then by the time they get to step seven, they can make decisions for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And they can help their family members make decisions and they can help their friends and their family yeah. make better decisions uh, when it comes to food, when it comes to lifestyle. Um, and if we can all do that, then it's going to be a much happier place. Imagine that yeah. where we really can create some really positive ripples with a framework. And when you speak to that, I know your personal story, but it's got more like juiciness to it because you had to go through your transformation. It wasn't like you were always super healthy. It wasn't like you didn't have your own struggles. So now like when we sit in these seats, myself included, having to go through my own health journey, it's like, how do we reverse engineer the process for people? How do we put it into a framework and how do we hopefully help them achieve that radical health? in a shorter span of time with more of a system to it. And that what gives you a bit more validity to being in this position too. You know, you're, you've been in this world, you've tried it. So for you, I'm now interested in your personal health story and, you know, some of the, maybe some of the mistakes that you made, some of the things that you learned along the way and, and where you've come full circle on that now. Well, there's been plenty of mistakes. I Always. Think that's, <laughs> you know, and there's still mistakes, you know, and, and that's one, one thing that I like about just what we're doing at heart and soil in general is that we're trying not to take a dogmatic approach we're trying to seek the truth and we're trying 
to be the guide in the story and mm-hmm. not the hero. Mm. And and that kind of brings it down to like why we're doing this podcast and everything else. But as it relates to my own personal story, um, you know, I grew up up in Michigan. You could say the country. I wasn't in a city center. I was, you know, outside of town. Um, I ate really great meals growing up. My yeah. my family, you know, we didn't we weren't extremely well off or anything. So, you know, home cooked meals every mm-hmm. single night. And I'm very grateful for that because I think that that probably gave me some foundational mm-hmm. level of health, you know, going into the college years where your habits start to change a little bit. Um, so going into college, yeah, it, I mean, eating the, the food at the residential halls, um, drinking beer on the weekends, mm-hmm. staying out late, doing all that kind of stuff. Now I was really dedicated to my schoolwork yeah, and I did well, but you know, also engaged in a little fun here and there and ate just shit food. Yeah. You know, I was call it shit food. Cause that's what it, what it really is. Yeah. Um, after my, my second year in college, I, you know, woke Woke up one day, my gut hurt a little bit, went to the bathroom, and I looked down in the stool and there's nothing but blood. Oh, man. I'm like, ooh, something's going on there, mm. you know? And so, like people do sometimes, and, and especially probably men in this case, I was like, well, that's nothing. I'm going <laughs> to uh, pretend I didn't just see ig- that. Let's, let's just, just ignore that pool of blood. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna, it's fine. It's fine. I'm going to go to my class and just move on. So, uh went to the bathroom later same thing mm. next day same thing yeah probably maybe a week passed and i was getting like intense cramps and just my stomach was upset and i was like man i got to i got to figure this out so doctor's appointment long story short um was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis mm. you know i was pretty young 20 i think i was well no i was like 19 and uh damn 19 years old ulcerative colitis i if you were to look at me at the time, you wouldn't, I mean, you wouldn't think, oh, that guy's unhealthy. Mm. You know, I had a six pack, could dunk a basketball. Um, you know, I grew up playing sports, so mm. I, I was an athlete. Uh, but I had this problem going on in the inside that I, I couldn't really make sense of it. And the doctors were like, you know, no big deal. It's your genetics. I have other people in my family who have Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, I believe psoriasis, a bunch of autoimmune conditions going on in my family. So, they just chalked it up to like, oh, genetics, here you go, here's some medication. And that medication was hell. I mean, yeah. I think it was like three times a day, these giant horse pills that gave you indigestion and it just wasn't good. And fortunately, you know, growing up eating the way that I did, home cooked meals, I kind of thought about it for a yeah. second. I was like, you know, one, I never liked taking medication when I was younger. I kind of had an aversion to it for some reason. Don't know why. Um, but I was like, I don't want to take this medication for the rest of my life. So what do I do? And just naturally, I'm like, well, you know, beer is probably not good for you. Mm, shocker. Eating a large <laughs> pizza is probably not good for you. Um, all this other crap at the residence hall probably isn't good for you. So I, I cleaned it up. Mm. You know, I just had an intuitive sense that the habits I was engaging with weren't good for me and i didn't want to ignore it because i was also thinking like man i'm young yeah you know if i'm 30 i saw this picture of a colostomy bag Mm. and i had this vision of myself with a colostomy bag and it was depressing Mm. you know it was not something that i wanted to end up with so i was kind of determined to do something to try to figure this thing out anyways long story short um removed a lot of the processed foods from my diet um you know took a break from the drinking and that probably took me 90 percent of the way there yeah where i was feeling much better um but i couldn't tell is it the medication Mm. totally doing this or is it the food um and then i kind of took a leap of faith and i was like i'm gonna wean myself off this medicine and see what happens so I took half the dose, you know, for a couple of days a week, went down to like one pill, and then I completely stopped. And what was interesting is nothing happened. And it was kind of the first signal that I had. Now I wasn't into the ancestral living yeah. at the time or anything like that, but it was it was kind of signal to me that um what you put in your body actually matters. Mm. Um 
so I took it seriously at the time. And fast forward maybe a year later, um, you know how life, there's always the ups and the downs and the different things. Uh, went through a number of struggles with surgeries and injuries from sports, um, which put me in a darker place, you know, where you, you tend to make not as good eating habits yeah, and, yeah. and you do stuff like that. And I'd have these short bouts where I'd get symptoms would come back. I'd start having issues with it. And around 2008, I stumbled upon uh, our friend Mark Sisson mm -hmm. and, and his content. And I just kept reading it and reading it. And I'm like, this guy's on to something mm -hmm. with this primal lifestyle. Um, adopted that. Um, and it became a lot easier for me to manage like cravings and things like this. Cause I think I was kind of getting to the root of what was actually going on, um, psychologically. Um, and then also just eating really good food. Yeah. You know, people think that you go on a diet, it has to be restrictive, mm. but this diet, I was eating vegetables at the time mm -hmm. and nuts and seeds and stuff, but man, I was like feeling like I had the best diet in the world, yep. you know? Yep. Nothing wrong with that. So that's a little bit about my story with ulcerative colitis. And I was finally able to, to kind of figure it out. And I've had multiple colonoscopies over the years since then. And the last probably four that I've had, the doctor's like, there's no visible sign yeah. of ulcerative colitis. Yeah. You know, they can send my cells to a lab and tell yeah, right. me that you have it. But um, it's a com in a completely uh, remissive state. Yeah, that's amazing, man. We haven't been doing that this podcast that long, and there's already been three examples off the top of my head of people that we've sat in the seat who've had ulcerative colitis, and I think it's just a massive epidemic of growing proportions. And like you said, luckily you had that intuitive pull to be like, mm, maybe there's something going on here with the food, and maybe I don't want to be on these medicines forever. But so many people right now might be listening to that and going like, ah, oh, that that sounds familiar for me too. I think. When I'm hearing you speak, you you use the word pain, and I and I think pain can be a really good teacher because nothing quickens consciousness quite like pain. Like when you're in pain and you see the pain of like blood in your stool, you're paying attention pretty quick. It gets you to ask questions, and luckily you stumbled into the right path and followed your gut. Funny feeling, right? Like a gut <laughs> yeah. feeling that I don't want to be on these medications and I don't think they're helping me, and trusted you into intuition because I'm sure if you'd have gone to doctor for that advice about like, hey could this be food? You'd have probably got the classic, no, it's genetics. Like you said, your family history. And I think uh, another powerful insight that I pulled then when you was talking is you, you had this desire to be healthy for sure and get away from this, but you really had this powerful motivating image of the colostomy bag at 30 years old. And it's very empowering and motivating sometimes to run away from pain as much as you're running towards health. You know, there's the whole, whole Jordan Peterson thing he says mm -hmm. about the rat study where they waft in the smell of cheese of starving rats and they see how hard they pull. And they pull really hard because they're starving rats. But then they run the experiment again and they waft in cheese from the front and they waft in the smell of a cat from behind and they pull almost twice as hard. So the lesson there is, yeah, you need to run towards something you want, but also something away from, away from what scares you, you know? And that is really scary, right? To be 19, stirring down the barrel of like, mm, if I don't fix this by... 30 years old, I might have a colostomy bag for the rest of my life. Like I'm running away from that. And thankfully you found good solutions and people like Mark, who's, you know, been very impactful on both of our health journeys, but it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, right? I know we've had private chats about your natural curiosity led you to trying the waters in different places. And you maybe even had a little stint with veganism, which you found was not the answer. What happened there? <laughs> yeah, I did have a stint with veganism. Um, if you know me, I'm I'm a pretty curious guy, yeah. and uh, I just like asking questions and trying new things. You know, when I was a kid, it was I would often rearrange my room, probably like once every two weeks, just because I like I like change, I like it when things are a little bit different. So, yeah, I stumbled upon uh, veganism through uh, where did, Forks Over Knives, mm. through the Forks Over Knives documentary. I watched that and. Um, we might get into this, but my previous career was in filmmaking mm. and kind of the creative stuff. So I understood what was going on there, you know, in, in terms of the emotional pull yeah. to try to sell an idea and got to be careful with documentaries sometimes and you need to do your own fact checking. But, you know, I was emotionally pulled by that a little bit and I was like, you know, I'm not going to knock this until I try it. And maybe, just maybe I'll like it. Mm. Maybe I'll feel even better than I was already feeling. And I was feeling pretty pretty damn good you know when i when i tried this so 
I bought uh, I bought a book by a triathlete who's you know a, a big influencer in the vegan space and read the book, learned how to construct you know a diet to the best of my ability, you know, making sure I was getting the right amino acids as, as many as I could and the, you know, the protein and all that kind of stuff. And it's a, one side note is it's a chore to I bet. eat, to, to eat that way. I bet. I felt like half of my life was preparing food mm. and cooking it and, um, not a really productive way to live in my opinion. No. <laughs> it was difficult. Um, but yeah, you know, I tried it out and I will say like the first probably three weeks, I was feeling, feeling pretty good. My energy was fine, yeah. you know, and I lost, I lost some fat at the time, which I was feeling good about. Um, but then I started losing some muscle. Mm. I couldn't, I couldn't keep muscle on, mm. which is weird for me because I, I've always been a fairly muscular guy and it's, it's pretty effortless yeah. for the most part for me to keep it on. Um, but you should see pictures. I wish I had a picture to share right now because my my neck like just shrunk, mm. and I I felt kind of fragile, if that makes sense. Um, so I only did it for like three months, and mm. a lot of this like I was losing muscle. Um, you know my body was changing in probably not a good way. Uh, and around two months in or so, um, well I had one comment from my wife. I was getting a little emotional about things all the time. Now. Oof, I don't but... know what led into that but she told me to to stop eating soy so you know <laughs> doing a lot of tofu burn and, by the wifey but yeah. i love it <laughs> um but the final straw was i was taking a shower one day and uh i put shampoo in my hair and i'm kind of I'm moving my hands around and i just glanced at my hand and i had a a hand full of hair oh, yeah. my hair started falling out um you know, I had brain fog and mm. my hair was falling out and I'm like, all right, I'm going to put an end to this experiment. This is that one's done. done. Yeah. yeah. So I went, I think the first thing I ate after that was I ate a whole giant tub of full fat yogurt. Yeah. Um, I ate a steak and man, did I feel pretty good after <laughs> Let's that. Let's go. Yeah. So yeah, that, you know, I tried it. Um, I'm happy I did. It was a good experience. Yeah. And, um, I've actually been able to have, you know, some good conversations with with vegans and i think that's a cool thing when you can sit down and absolutely and have a conversation with somebody who has a completely different view uh from your own and a lot of those conversations have uh they've been rewarding yeah you know and i've learned things and the person i'm talking to learns things and i've actually converted a couple of people yeah good from, from the vegan side um which is fine and dandy you yeah know? um and i care about people's health so when, when i see that happening and then people take on an animal-based diet and then they're thriving you know they're like my gosh thank you yes. for talking to me about that um makes you feel good it does yeah. yeah and we were talking about this off air as well that we actually think in this debate between the meat eaters and the vegans there's actually a lot more common ground and parallels than we ever want to give credit to or really think about because it seems like they're extreme opposites um but really yeah there's a lot of overlap into the motivating factors around like yeah we care about the way our food is raised we care about health we care about the environment we care about health for our families and our every everything you know so there's there's a lot of uh, polarity there and i think it it gives you more just authenticity again and a, and a nice middle ground to have those conversations because you tried it and I, and I love that approach right your mm -hmm. curiosity can sometimes get you in trouble but you learn a lot from it again and then you've got some lessons to continue to apply to life so now you, you fix it you come back to more of this kind of primal and ancestral lens of food and yeah like you said you were working uh, a different career in a different path more in a marketing direction and then all of a sudden like this is again a few years ago I, I see you popping up on stories and it seems like you're hanging out with paul and you guys are doing this crazy thing and there's these organ supplements and i just see like a house and a lawn and it's full of these crates and there's boxes and I'm like what is going on here so how did heart and soil come to be and, and what's your story there how did you get involved yeah good question so after the vegan thing didn't pan out for me th then i was all in on on this primal lifestyle and you know i was in before but that vegan experience really kind of solidified mm -hmm. it for me and not to mention it's uh, kind of this paleo animal based th this ancestral lens it's the first thing in my life where you know i've tried all kinds of different diets in mm -hmm. the past and um it, it gets confusing after a while it's like this is good now this is bad now this is good now this is bad and it's really difficult to navigate um when you're just you're focused on 
you know, the, the very granular um, perspective and you're not, you're not zooming out. But this whole ancestral lens, is, it was the first time that I had the aha moment mm -hmm. of like, this makes sense mm -hmm. actually. And it's not hard for me to make decisions about what to do and what not to do. Um, so yeah, I went straight into the, to the primal uh, lifestyle more or less. And it's when I met you. I, you know, Mark Sisson was on what a couple weeks ago on this yeah. podcast and um, you guys were talking about passion and I really liked his perspective on, you know, get rid of passion for a second and what are you compelled to do? Mm -hmm. And I was extremely compelled to be able to share this with other people because it, it certainly changed my life, yeah. you know, removing processed foods from my diet. Um, and like I said, that took me maybe 80, 90% of the way there. But when I started incorporating the other lifestyle stuff that I learned, um, you know, through the ancestral lens, like sun exposure, moving around often at a slow pace, incorporating, you know, high intensity exercise every so often, paying attention to the quality of your water. Um, that stuff took me the rest of the way there and it, and it, probably more or less saved my life you know mm -hmm. like we talk about the colostomy bag and and you know living that type of life this changed my life so i'm like i want other people to to know about this you know it, it kind of feels irresponsible yeah if if i'm not telling people about it yeah so anyways i yeah i decided to go into the primal health coach institute and get a uh, certification to health coach at the time i was like i don't know how i'm going to use this i think i might health coach um, my other career path was I, I was in creative, I was in marketing, I was a filmmaker. I've started a number of businesses um, on my own and with others in the past. Some of them worked out, some of them didn't. Um, and I've always been very passionate, just uh, I think about business. My dad was, a, was an entrepreneur and started a business out of our garage mm -hmm. when I was young. So I think I formed some kind of identity yeah, around yeah. you know being a business guy or you know, starting my own thing. Um, so I was excited. I, I dove in head first into the, into the primal health coach stuff, started, started an LLC, started helping people. Um, I also got a personal training certificate at the time. So I was kind of juggling this full-time career mm -hmm. where I, I was leading a, a studio of creatives and we were producing content, doing this kind of stuff. And then on the side, on nights, weekends, I was hustling, uh, doing this and trying to spread the word, trying to help people. Um, eventually, which is the coolest thing in the world, um, I met Paul. Mm. I actually met Paul in a sauna in Austin, Classic. which is crazy. I mean, how fitting. Right? Yeah, like, so good. <laughs> met Paul in a sauna. Was uh, he eating a steak in the sauna or just in the sauna? <laughs> I wish he was. <laughs> that would have no. been better, right? Yeah. Maybe some liver. <laughs> he actually had, he had a prototype of the fir very first heart and soil oh, nice. uh, beef organs bottle. I remember when I met him. And, you know, we were talking, I had, you know, my career going on and he was talking about starting, starting this business, Heart and Soil. And he was with two other people, uh, Doug and Dylan, who mm -hmm. are with us, our chief research officer, Dylan, who you've seen on the podcast mm -hmm. previously, and, and Doug Schneider, our chief operating officer. Got to know them, you know, over a couple week period. And this is kind of weird. I just kept running into Paul. Mm. You know, I saw him in the sauna and then I ran into him again a week later, I ran into him again. There's that serendipity again, yes, right? Yes, yes. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the launch of Heart and Soil, I think it was like July 26, 2020, middle of the pandemic. Mm. Um, the company I was working at was in FinTech and we were, you know, working from home at the time. And Paul was like, yeah, we're going we're gonna to launch this thing. And I was like, you need any help? And he's like, I think I might need some help. It's like, all right. So I, I literally was at Heart and Soil HQ, which was Paul's rental house mm -hmm. uh, on the day that it launched. And I was, I probably shouldn't say this, but I was on a marketing call at my previous company in, in FinTech while I was helping, uh, you know, pack yeah. supplements into packages. And um, yeah, and it was just exciting. So I, I helped out with the business for about three months and there might be a good lesson or some wisdom in this as well. Um, I worked for free for, mm. for three months, two to three months. Didn't, uh, didn't ask for a thing. I wasn't expecting 
anything out of it. Um, it was just my, my passion mm -hmm. for, for this stuff. And, um, I thought it was really neat that, you know, we can take the, the nutritional power of these organs and we can put them in a very convenient capsule and, and people can get them like shipped to their home. You yeah. know, it's, it's really hard if you try to go get like brain or yep. testicle, yep. like it's not accessible. So I was just happy to be a part of it. And, you know, after a few months was helping them solve a, a couple, couple problems, challenges, mm -hmm. you know, in the beginning phases, it's really hard to, it's really hard to start a business from nothing, you know, from scratch. I believe it. And I had some experience and some perspective and, um, some ideas for the company to contribute and Paul and you know, the whole group over there were like, we need you to come on full time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that was, that was a really, really cool moment. Cause again, I wasn't expecting anything, but when I got asked that and, you know, they told me like really value, you know, what you're doing here and we want to, we want you to be part of this and help out. It's extremely grateful mm. for that opportunity. Uh, obviously, you know, married had to talk about it with the wife and, uh, measure the pros and cons, but in, in my head, it was like a no brainer. Yeah but kind of scary at the same, same time. Cause you know, you're about to leave a career where you've, you've put so much effort into it. You know, I, I've always worked very hard. Um, I spend a lot of time even outside of work in my previous roles, just learning and learning and, and trying to be the best that I can possibly be at that particular mm -hmm. role. So when it came to, to to come in here it's like part of you might think like oh well, i worked really hard to get here so do i want to go work for this company that really doesn't exist yeah, at right. all um and there's you know the, there's a lack of security there mm. when you look at it through that lens but um i just jumped right in yeah yeah it was the thing to do and yeah. again back back to also looking forward i pictured myself as like a 80 year old man um, and I didn't get to this earlier, but my grandfather has had an incredible influence on my life and he lived a long and healthy life. And uh, I always looked up to him because, you know, when he was on his deathbed, he couldn't look, he didn't look back and say, I wish I would have done this. Mm. Wish I would have done this. And it was one of those moments I asked myself, if I make this leap over here and do this, am I going to, if I don't do it, rather, am I going to regret it? Um, and I knew the instant I thought about that, I'm like, I will regret this for the rest of my life yeah. if I don't take this chance and try to like bridge these passions that I have for business and creative storytelling yeah. and helping people, you know, yeah. helping the world get healthier. Yeah, you, you arrived at that classic moment that a lot of us face in some way, shape or form, like the, the proverbial crossroads, right? Left yeah. or right, stay or go, yes yeah. or no. And I think that reframe, I love playing with that reframe, like you you have to choose your regrets in life. Nobody's getting out without any regrets. So like positioning yourself in the future and looking back and saying, well, I could choose the, the peaceful, safe thing right now, but I have to live forever with the open loop of what if I did this thing that feels certainly more aligned and it feels exciting, but yeah, you've got all of that scarcity and safety and all of that stuff. And you just, you said it, you said a leap of faith. It's not called a leap of certainty. It's not called a leap yeah, of guarantee. Yeah. You yeah. need a trust. You need a knowing that all of that stuff that you've just talked about, learning and putting yourself out there and now are these weird like little pulls from something almost mysterious, you know? Well, it's like, how growth happens, Yeah, right? Like you, you don't get stronger unless you go to the gym and you, you challenge your body. Mm. And it, it's kind of how I feel about just life in general, yeah. right? Like you have to put yourself in places where you're uncomfortable. Yeah. This podcast, for example, never been on a podcast before yeah. and uh, it's uncomfortable to sit here and talk and know that there's all these eyeballs yeah. watching you, but you have to do it. If things scare you a little bit like that, you have to jump in. Yes. Um, Fear I, is the compass. Yeah, I read something one time about designing a life that you don't want to escape. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I can't remember who said it, but that kind of rang true mm -hmm. you know, with me when I was going through that. And I'm like, you know, this is going to be fun. Yes. You know, it's going to be, I mean, yeah, late nights. Yeah. I think for, for months, a year, no weekends off. Yes. You know, no nights off. But if you look back at your life and you think about what are those, at least for me, what are those moments where I've had the most joy? Yes. And they've always involved 
sacrifice. They've always involved hard work. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I have some high school sports memories where you think you were going to lose and you, you dig deep and it goes into two OTs and, and you win Mm. or you lose and it's still a good bonding experience, you know, with your teammates. I don't know. That's kind of how I look at it. Oh, I love it, man. Cause you, you, you're kind of like, in a sense, there's this, there's this like, I'm sure you even might do this to yourself sometimes, like, like pinch me as this real kind of thing. Did I just <laughs> yeah. get lucky? But then there's this reframe of like, maybe there's no such thing as luck. Luck is when preparedness meets opportunity and you were prepared, you were learning, you were growing, you were going on this investigation of your own health. And then this opportunity arised and you could mm-hmm. jump on it. And then, like you said, though, this myth in our culture that if you find a job you'll love, you'll never work a day in your life. What a load of shit. <laughs> I heard the Apple CEO say, no, that's wrong. If you find a job you love, you'll work harder for it than you ever would anything else, but the tools off. will feel lighter in your hands. Yes. And that's what you're just describing. Like, no, if I love something, I'll give more of myself to it. I'll be able to pull the late nights at first to get this thing off the ground. I'll be able to sacrifice temporarily these weekends because of what I'm buying back for myself in the future, which is my alignment, my passions, my just again, that, that just feeling of being in alignment and doing what you do and now getting to do it. Now, yeah, I'm sure it's hard work. I'm sure there are unexpected challenges, but there is, because you love it, you'll, you'll work for it and you care about it and you've got real serious skin in the game because it's, it's bigger than just a position or a title or a salary. It's a, it's a mission. It's who you are. And like you said, you wanted to give that back. And I think it's really cool to be able to sit here and sometimes get that reflected back to you. Like, oh yeah, it is really cool. Right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and it's, it's more than that too, is it's the people here. Yes. Um, and I, I do pinch myself sometimes and I've, I've pinched myself or I've told the team I've pinched myself because I'm just surrounded by a group of people who inspire me Mm -hmm. every day, you know, and it's, it's a great group of people. At the end of the day, a company is a group of people. And what's cool about Heart and Soil is we all share this passion to live this lifestyle and to share it with others. Many of the people on our team, they've you know had their own health struggles yep. themselves and they've discovered this yep. each in their own way. And you know, it's kind of serendipitous for me to be here, but that's the same story for almost everybody on the team, which is a really cool thing to be surrounded by. Yeah, it's awesome, man. And I get this uh, outsider perspective to a degree with this because as much as every time I come here, I feel like part of this family and I am part of this family. I'm the family member that also lives in a different state, you know? So I go home to Tennessee and I'm a, you know, a solopreneur. I'm doing my own thing out there. There's no, you know, I have my family and my land, but I don't have people. I don't have my like community to work with. And, and I get this juxtaposition of coming back to Austin, taking these three to four day trips and just plopping myself right in here and just feeling the magic of this culture that you've been able to foster. And like you said, that the really cool thing for me is that everybody here has got a story like everybody does. And it's a healing story and they want to pay it forward. And you've just got people that are healthy and vibrant and they're getting healthier and they're healing and the culture is great and the the balance, but also the hard work. It's the play hard, it's the work hard. And it feels really good. And I feel that when I come here, it's, it's, it's energy gaining. It's not energy draining. It's, it's good to be around people that get it and share in that. So what, what is it about creating that? Like you said, in a way, it's a bit of a pinch me and maybe it's just the consequence of you kind of create like a, a black hole of magnetism for the right kind of people when you create something out of alignment. But it also takes some steering because if there's too much, it's chaotic, right? So it's like, how do you find that balance and how have you been able to foster this really cool culture? And uh, yeah, what does that like afford you as the the leader uh, and the CEO of a, of a company like that? Great question. Um, I think it really boils down, you know, if I can get in a little bit of like the the business yeah. stuff. Um, companies struggle with this. Companies struggle with alignment. Uh, a lot of times they have like a single bottom line. They don't know exactly who they are. Mm. Um, you ever hear that phrase? It's like, what's good for the individual is good for a family, is good mm-hmm. for a community, is good for, you know, a nation. Um, as an individual, I think for you to truly thrive, in your life, you need to know who you are. Mm. You need to kind of figure out in a way, what is it that I want to do? Uh, I think the same thing goes for a business. You have to know who you are, who you want to be, and what you want to do in the world. Um, That's essentially your mission. You have to be very clear about that. Um, You also have to be very clear about 
what your values are. Mm. What do you value as an organization? Um, and those values should be shared, you know, by an individual, by teams, and by the organization. Um, so I think you need very strong alignment in those areas, and you have to be uncompromising mm. when it comes to who you bring in to the team. You have to be uncompromising with how you make decisions mm. as an organization. A lot of places take a mission statement and they put it on a wall, or they take their values and they write it in an employee handbook. Um, but if you look at how business is actually done at those places, they're not living true to their values. Mm. Um, and it, it's hard to keep people motivated and to, to all work in the same direction, if that's the case. Yeah. Um, and you get chaos, you get discontentment, you have a lot of problems down the line. And so for us, you know, our mission is to offer the world's highest form of nutrition and inspire and guide others to radical health. Um, it's very clear, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we offer these amazing supplements, you know, that are, that can be accessible for people that will really help in the health outcomes. And then we want to inspire people to live healthier and we want to guide them mm. to radical health. Um, and everybody's on board with that. And that's, it, it is why we're made up of, of folks who have gone through this themselves. Yeah. Um, cause I think another key to building a really strong organization is, I said it before, but the people that you bring on. And, and so we have to be, as you grow and you bring more people into the fold, you have to be very careful not to have, not to, not to um, you know, bring in the wrong folks. A lot of places are like, oh, well, this person's a really high performer. Mm -hmm. You know, they could do this, this, and this for us. And they'll ignore, mm -hmm. they'll ignore, you know, maybe one or two small things that have to do with value alignment. Mm. Um, because they want to get whatever that performance outcome is. Yeah. But you have to you have to really check yourself there. Yeah. Um so yeah, I think those are two two main things. Um and then I think you have to have incredible leadership. And when I say that, I don't know what pe people picture exactly, but leadership isn't a a, a non-active type of position. You have to serve your team you have to serve mm -hmm. the individuals on your team you have to put a lot of times their interest above your own mm -hmm. um but i think if you have that that shared passion that shared vision you're all on the same page you know what you want to do in the world um and you have that servant mentality servant type of leadership then i think you'll go a long ways you'll be yeah very successful in the long run yeah, because if you're all working towards the common thing, there's less of a, a gap or a deficit to mask through these other through the other things, yeah. right? You said a, you, a couple of things that I think I, I one of the mental models I always apply to life for me, myself personally is like how you do little things is how you do the big things, mm -hmm. or how you do one thing is how you do everything. And you said like companies just get told that they should have a mission statement of value, so they write it in a book and then it just gathers dust somewhere. <laughs> they stick it on the wall and it just gathers dust somewhere. You also said that. When companies are hiring certain people, they'll they'll ignore the little red flags because of this other thing here. But how you ignore the little stuff, like your values, like your mission statement, like these little cracks, they're only going to get bigger because they're how you do the, the the big things essentially. Yeah. So you've got to really have like that dialed in from a micro level because that's going to create the macro level, and that's only going to get more challenging as you grow. And that's probably why it's even more important to have those values so rock steady and like mm. dug th those roots dug really deep so that you know exactly what it is that you want and exactly where you're going. Because otherwise, if you don't take stock of that, you might just end up where you're going and that might not be the trajectory you want to go. So it's exactly. Some and there, good there's opportunity costs with, you know, where you spend your time for sure and what you decide to work on. A lot of businesses. Also, you know, they don't know where they're, what, where they're going, um, and they have trouble sometimes coming up with like a sense of urgency mm. because it might be interpreted that the, the work isn't important, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think that's like, we have the opposite yeah, it's <laughs> uh, important. thing here, you know, like there's high stakes here. There's millions of people suffering. Yes. Every, you know, I talk to people all the time and you know, I ask them, you know, anybody with an autoimmune condition, everybody knows somebody. Yeah, it's with everyone. Now, yeah. Right? Everyone knows somebody with it. And this is a real problem that mm -hmm. we're facing. And so 
for us, it's like there's a huge sense of opportunity mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. And uh, we just need to do our best in executing it. Yes. Do the best. And the more we can help folks get to a better place with their help, um, the faster this thing can spread and, and people will know about this. People can vote with their dollars like at the mm-hmm. grocery store. And we'd love to see you know, a future where there's zero seed oils on a grocery store shelf. Let's go. That'd be amazing. Let's go. Yeah. That would be cool. What is, you know, like all of these different inputs kind of throwing pebbles into a pond and watching our ripples go out and hopefully Aunt Soil is not throwing a pebble, it's throwing a giant block and causing a crazy ripple and a tsunami of hell to spread. So what is the big, audacious, ridiculous goal for Heart and Soil? Like, what is it that's like just, if we allowed ourselves to dream obnoxiously large and dream big, what does that look like? It's a really good question. I mean, one thing, I mentioned the seed oils thing. Like, if there's zero seed oils on the grocery store shelf, or you go into like a Seven Eleven or gas station, and there's, you know, I'm obviously being, uh, this is a long-reaching goal. Good, we need that. I that would be amazing, right? Um, that would be incredible. Another thing that would be pretty cool is if the animal-based diet was number one in search terms when it comes to diets. Yes, you know, talked about that with a few people before. Um, I think we're trailing plant-based right now. So everybody uh, hop on Google and search animal-based diet. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, those are goals, but I also think like, you know, helping a million people Mm. would be amazing. We have a goal here actually to get to 200,000 radical health seekers, Mm -hmm. you know, in the next three years. Um, And we have a specific definition for, Mm -hmm. you know, who that person is, but uh, Really, our main goal over the next three years is to affect as many lives as we possibly can. I love it. I love it. I know something we've talked about over dinner as well in the past is like, what if we got to this position where we normalized the liver pills and the organ pills or the whole package or whatever it is, made that as normal as going and picking up a jar of Centrum off the shelves from your local CVS. Yeah, I didn't mention that one, but- That would be rad. Yeah, taking taking a, a liver pill is just as normal as taking a synthetic multivitamin. Yeah. Or if they just replace multivitamins altogether, altogether. you know, because yeah. as Paul would say, that stuff is bullshit. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> For the most Synthetic part. Synthetic nonsense. Real yes. food is medicine as your story. And as the growing tens of thousands of people are showing us now that food really is medicine, you can heal. And hopefully yes. we can say soon enough that that's millions of people that have found health through animal-based eating and organs and real food supplementation. And Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's what gets us all here. And that's what wakes us up in the morning, right? Cause you're right. There's a, it's a big battle on our hands right now with what 88% of the U S population classified as metabolically unhealthy. I think it's 30 to 40% obese and the extra 30% on top of that is overweight. Like we have work to do and it's not just that the physical stuff, it's also the mental health crisis that we've got on our hands. Now the division, the fear, the anxiety, the exploding rates of depression and male suicide and you name it. It's pretty it's pretty intense out there and this is this is one of the very powerful long levers that we can get in and really affect change and mm-hmm. i think that's what we're going to try and do man that's what we're going to try what, and do. that's what we will do and i wanted to we're gonna we're gonna chat to a couple of callers here in a second but the last thing i wanted to ask you is all of this stuff you know this this leadership stuff this being a, a lifelong learner a, a curious person and how that's affected business and who you are as a person is all fine and dandy, but you're about to go through another initiation process of becoming a dada and becoming a father. And that is quite something, right? So where's your head out with that whole story? And maybe what's being a leader of something like Heart and Soil? How's it, how's it maybe set you up for success in this brand new territory? And uh, yeah, what's the story there, man, as you're on the cusp of becoming father? Yeah, so I'm expecting a little girl in the next three to four weeks. Um, I, I'm just so excited about the opportunity and a little anxious about it, oh, yeah. to be honest. A little, um, I wouldn't, maybe scared is not the right word, but it's, it's like fear of the unknown, right? You know, yes, he's quite, am I going to be a good father? Mm. Am I going to, you know, have enough time, mm. you know? And, and that's something that you have to make. You have to carve out, you have to make it a priority had a call with a mentor recently and he asked me how I schedule my time. And so I showed him, I'm like, oh, that's easy. You know, like I'm a productivity nerd. 
I'll show you my Asana. I'll show you my calendar. Yeah, yeah. Here's here's how I put my stuff in here. And he's like, well, I see you're you're doing time blocking and it's this is all good stuff, but like, where's the time for your wife? Mm. I was like, I didn't have a good answer for him. Like, it's a damn good point, Taylor. <laughs> and so it, it kind of was a good reminder for me mm. that you know, it, we need to be very intentional about the application to our priorities. And, you know, I say, oh, I prioritize my family, right? Mm. But then Taylor's pointing out to me, I'm not scheduling time with my wife first on my calendar. Yes. Um, and so, you know, there, there's a bit of a fear unknown with having a child. I'm very ready for it. Yeah. I mean, I'm 30, 38 years old this month, actually in another week. Um, so I'm very ready for it. I'm excited about it. I'm excited to have a child. I have no idea what it's going to be like. Yeah. Um, but there's some anxiety there yeah. a little bit. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to approach it like anything. I'm going to do the best that I possibly can do. I'm going to pay attention. I'm going to try to reflect. Um, and I'm going to be a great dad. That's it, man. That's yeah. all you can do. This is one of the things as well that it's a, a complete trial by fire. There's no book you can read and you can listen to the advice of your friends and all of that stuff. But until you're in it, you're like, oh, this is what it is. Okay. And you you just, I think with your intentionality and how you're approaching it, you're in the perfect spot because I see parenting as the greatest mirror imaginable in terms of what it's teaching me about myself. And I actually have completely reframed moving from this position of being my son's teacher to him being my teacher. He's shown me everything that I've got to learn about life through how I am structuring my priorities and how I can get so bent out of shape over little things and how just the playful and present. And it's a wonderful process. And I shared this quote with you offline, but I basically said, um, having a child will destroy your current life, but replace it with a better one. And I think that's what you're going to go through. There's a little bit of a chaotic moment and a little bit mm -hmm. of a feeling of destruction of like, ah, <laughs> but it's going to replace it with a better one. All of the things that you've talked about, your values, your integrity, they're just going to be enhanced and made richer through this process. So I, I agree, it. man, you're going to be a heck of a dad. You're I gonna love be it. a heck of a dad. So thank you, man. Let's uh let's talk to some callers. How about that? All right, let's, let's do it. And interacting with some folks. We got Karen on the line from Oregon. And are you are you hearing us, Karen? You good? I'm here. Hey, what's going on? How can we help you today? Hi, thank you. Uh, my question is concerning my sixteen year old son. He plays baseball and he's a pitcher. And he often has what they call pitcher's arm, mm. where he has intense pain from his elbow to his shoulder. And um, the coaches work with him and other athletes there also. Yeah. But they really don't have um, great suggestions. And um, the thing they kind of fall back on, and I noticed this with other athletes um, that he's playing with as well, is they – suggest taking an ibuprofen mm. before um, they play a game just to numb that pain so they can get through it. Um, and I know that's not good. And especially they're usually taking that on an empty stomach, mm. but these are teenage boys. And um, so I didn't know if there was something he's probably 80% animal based. We have raw milk, eggs. He loves he, he'll eat that, you know, but he is a teenager. So when he's right. out and about, he just eats what everyone else eats. Right. But I'd love to help him somehow and just get the word out to his friends too. If there's something natural animal based that could help support him. Yeah. With that. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Karen. I, I definitely share your potential concerns around, you know, the over abuse of the ibuprofen on an empty stomach. Those those medications can be quite harsh and it doesn't address the root cause of what's really going on here. Right. You can see an argument to be made for prophylactically using this to mask the pain so that they can play. And ultimately, I guess that's the goal. But if we are sticking that bandaid over the bullet wound of why is the pain there in the first place? 
were potentially just staying blind to what we could actually get in and fix. And hearing the the comments you made about diet is really reassuring, you know, to have a 16 year old that is about 80% of the way there is probably about 80% of the way there more than most teenagers are. You know, the other 20%, I guess an argument could be made for how much of that is, is spiking a little bit of inf inflammation and is it a bit more important to pay attention to that around, you know, the, the game day and the recovery period. But before we kind of do a deep dive in the nutrition space and see if there's any, you know, supplements or something that could potentially help. I also want to just address the training, the repetitive stress and what has helped me um, heal repetitive use injuries, because that's what, you know, this, this condition is, right? I had repetitive movement patterns that will develop things like um, tendonitis or tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, pitcher's shoulder, you name it. These are just because there's a lot of force going through that arm repetitively over and over again. And I think, you know, strength and mobility are key. Strength is never a weakness. Weakness is never a strength. When there's pain present, there is often weakness. Not in the more classical uh, kind of idea that the weakness is a, a muscle weakness, like can't do push-ups, for example, but a weakness in the full ability for the joint to circumvent and rotate the way that it could. So what I would do here is to really consider having your son look into more unconventional training methods at the shoulder that are going to be more in the realm of mobility. You're going to be um, kind of seeking out advice here through uh, YouTube and stuff like that, going on there and, and searching for shoulder CARS, CARS are C-A-R-S. They stand for Controlled Articular Rotations. And basically that's going to help the shoulder just really restore function through its entire range of motion. I've said this on a podcast in the past, but I think it's incredibly over underrated. Sorry, there's a there's a doctor actually that said you know and he used to be a shoulder surgeon, and now he can heal about seventy five percent of shoulders naturally just through hanging instead of having the person have to end up on the operating ta table at one point. So that's getting a bar in the house or getting a bar at the gym and having your son practice just some overhead hanging from the bar to really allow all of those tissues that are getting inflamed to stretch out and decompress and to allow the shoulder girdle and the socket to decompress and to stretch out the small muscles at the back in the rotator cuff and it opens up the pec. So those are things that from a training standpoint, I'd be really considering doing. Another maybe seed that you could point um, or, or kind of plant in your son's ear is if he is also training because he's an athlete, to maybe dial it back sometimes on a lot of the mirror muscle exercises that I know I was hammering when I was 16 years old, just like smashing the bench press, smashing everything in front of me and creating excessive tightness and focusing a little bit more on opening up that posterior chain because our lives are so anteriorly dominant and forward flexed, including all of these pitching exercises in the finished position at least. Now you're opening up when you're pulling that arm back to launch the ball and training in that posture a little bit more to, to train the scapula, to train the rowing motions. So mobility, again, shoulder cars, controlled articular rotations and hanging would be kind of postural adjustment and training kind of adjustments that I would make. And then nutritionally, I guess we can carry on this conversation um, in terms of, you know, any insights there. Dean, I know you was a high school athlete, not football athlete, right? And you've probably dealt with a fair share of injuries over the years. Yeah. I know you've been under the knife a couple of times, but what would you say in a situation like this to help potentially just ease any overuse injuries and stress? Yeah, good question. I actually played baseball too. I pitched. Oh, nice. Had there you go. Similar issue. Um, I mean, I really think you nailed it on the mobility stuff. Um, if, if functionally, you're not working correctly it, it, the issue is always going to exist there mm -hmm. like if that's causing the problem um but nutritionally i would definitely look at what is the other 20 percent mm -hmm. there um and i would do anything and everything possible to make your make sure he's given his body the right inputs to minimize inflammation mm. um i had a number of issue, injuries similar to this and this might not be the the news you want to hear, but I had to take time off mm. and let it heal first. Um, I had that going on with patella tendonitis uh, during track season. I just had to take some time off because it it just hurt me so much, and I had some mechanical issues with the way my body was functioning. So I would look at that, and then I would also ask you like, how much is he sleeping? Yeah. Is he getting adequate rest? Um, that, that would be one question I would have because you'd be surprised on 
how much uh, you need sleep. And, you know, damage isn't necessarily going to heal very quickly if, if you're not sleeping and if your body's in like an acute stress state. Super good point. What's the story though, Karen? Are you aware of like sleep patterns or late night screens or all of that stuff? Hmm. Yeah, that a really good insight from Dean though, because we actually realize again it's so it's such a simple low hanging fruit behavior that if we could kind of package the effects of a good night of sleep and sell it as a, a supplement, it would basically be a banned performance enhancing drug. It's that powerful. All of the breaking down that we do during the day through these movements is all fixed in sleep. All of it. it only when we stop and rest do the recur processes kick in. So if now you're pulling away from that and instead of getting ideally a nice seven to eight hours of sleep in a cold dark room in a emf free environment and you're restoring and you know you're only getting six or you're only getting five and right up until the point where you went to sleep you were blasting yourself with blue light that's a really important piece to look at and i think as you know mom in this situation it's about drawing those uh, educational parallels i guess just really stressing the importance of like hey sleep it really does matter and you can see athletes that we've had on this podcast talk about the importance of that and i know it's not that sexy and it's not a pill that we can take or a particular exercise we can do but it might be the thing that maybe moves the needle the most so definitely addressing sleep and then the last point I wanted to make as well is just to your point again, Dean, this managing or mitigating the 20% a little bit to increase resiliency. Like if you're doing 80% of it right, you're, you're, you're definitely heading in the right um, area, but the 20% is probably going to be exposure to foods that we kind of talk about awareness around a lot, which is probably going to be seed oils and gluten containing grains. Something I've become really fascinated with recently is the ability to potentially mitigate seed oil exposure through vitamin E. And that's found in fire starter. It's found in suet and kidney fat. And it can potentially be the case that if you consume a good saturated fat, a long chain saturated fat like that, full of vitamin E at the same time as poofers are coming in, that it can potentially displace those. So what you can kind of look at that as is, okay, you know, I have a 16 year old. He's still going to eat some of these things. Maybe we can educate him and get that 20% to 10%. But maybe we can also treat that as like a little bit of an insurance policy too. So I think what we want to do is send you a free bottle of fire stuff. Data. And then Dean, do you think there's anything else just from a tissue connectivity supportive standpoint that could be a cool supplement to get them? Yeah. Uh, skin, hair, and nails would be another cool. one I would consider um, for the uh, cartilage and the connective tissue. Awesome. I was um, actually going to share a quick yeah. antidote too. Um, about a year ago, I was struggling with uh, uh, Achilles tendonitis. And I was eating eating like a primarily meat based diet, but I was eating a lot of chicken mm. and a lot of pork. Mm. Um, and you know, I talked talked with Doctor Paul about it, and you know, the amount of linoleic acid mm -hmm. I was consuming, uh, he was a little bit concerned that maybe that was causing inflammation. So I cut out chicken and pork uh, for about three weeks. Went strictly red meat, ruminant animal, grass fed, grass finished, and I'm not even kidding the the pain in my achilles reduced by probably like 90 percent. Mm. like it almost went away over the course of weeks so that's super um, cool yeah just a, a small tip there if, if he's eating a lot of chicken a lot of pork mm. um, those types of meats then then maybe try um including mostly red meat yeah and that that even brings up another point too like the potential addition of more collagen from more ground beef or yeah. the slower cooked options of of beef like the you know the chuck roasts or the the also buco the shanks they're really rich in collagen which is going to kind of give you that matrix to rebuild so we threw a lot at you karen you've got some homework <laughs> how are you feeling about all of that fantastic i'm really excited because you guys brought up a lot of points that i hadn't thought of and i want him to listen back to this yes and hear it from you too because i think that will resonate a little bit more with people who know what they're talking about <laughs> and mom what's his but, name yeah, i really appreciate it landon landon listen to your mom landon let's go landon <laughs> you got it mom mom knows best always mom knows best thank you very much karen best of luck and uh f let, let, we'll be following up with you to see how everything goes all right awesome and uh lisa we got a lisa from california are you with us lisa what can we help you with today 
Yes, hi. Thank you for taking my call. Um, it's another mama calling in about a question about a son. We <laughs> um, love our mamas. I want to say my, you know what, it's, I can't wait for, I know, um, I'm sorry, you're, the other person's name who's about to have a baby, but you're going to experience a depth of love that you've never tapped into being a new daddy. So that is going to be a, a part I, I just want to share with you, and it only grows and grows and grows. So oh, I'm thank excited you. for you in that area. <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, my son um, has had a lot of digestive problems for a long time, um, and he found um, Dr. Saladino somehow in his research, and he started to listen what he Paul had to say. And so we were able to get a um, discover um, a heart and soil and start him on these supplements. And the challenging thing for me is that he lives in Indonesia and in the Mentawai Islands, a very isolated island. Mm. And but we were able to get him the supplements and also take him out, get him off seed oils. And it changed his health in a way that I mean, he's tried for years and, you know, it's, it's, it's been painful for him. It's affected his moods, everything with this, the whole digestion thing. So I knew he was on to something. So then I have now jumped in. And I'm a person who's never, I never eat very much red meat, never drank cow's milk. And I was, I mean, I, you know, I, so many things have changed in my life since I've discovered heart and soil. And I am now, you know, eating only red meat, honey. I mean, I, I follow things pretty radically. It, it, the radical changes from doing that are so exciting and it's hard because I was with a girlfriend last night eating the marrow out of a bone and she's just looking at me <laughs> yeah. it's like yes I can't believe. <laughs> and I'm eating my dog and I every morning I get one piece for my dog one piece for myself a little raw liver out of our freezer wait for it to fall in the morning and I'm and eating it things that I never imagined just because you grow up and you know you you believe that oh my gosh you would never you should never eat red meat mm-hmm. as much as I do or raw liver and now that I am, you know, and now I'm drinking raw milk, the best dessert is raw milk and honey every night. It's yeah. incredible. better than ice cream. So good. But it's like, how do you help people to, you know, um, to make that, make that switch or because of how, you know, how we're educated and thought to believe that red milk meat's not good for you, et cetera, et cetera. So I've had my own radical health journey as well as my son. So my big question right now is my bag are packed. I'm heading to Indonesia tonight and I've got 15 bottles of supplements, <laughs> you know, and Zelda's so suitcase on the way to Indonesia because he's just about out of what he has and trying to figure out the combination of supplements that would, that gives the most like full spectrum of organs that you recommend. Because I could, I could have a jar every single one of those supplements. I, every time I order, I've got another thing I'm adding on. Right. So I have a, handful of pills I take every day and um, because I, I, I want the benefits of everything. But if I want to try to introduce this to a friend and say, this is a, just try this, this stack right here, mm-hmm. that will get, that would give them the most opportunity to have a, the benefits of all these different organs. Is there a, a, like a specific, like certain products that we recommend to somebody to get started to, to get those benefits? Yes, absolutely. Awesome. This this was such a cool one, Lisa, because we love we love these success stories. But when it's a, a family affair, it's even better. And I I get you. We we get evangelical about this. We want to scream it from the rooftops, and everybody should be sucking the bone marrow out of bones. Let's go. Uh, I think the best thing you could do, and we'll talk about supplements in a second, but is to let your example lead the way. There's that old cliched saying that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. But you can make the horse very curious. You can make it thirsty. And the way you do that is you just live your radical health example. The people that know you are going to see you change it. They're going to see the things that you order on the dinner menu. They're going to see that you look really good. You're glowing. You are losing weight. You, You look strong. Whatever those things are, they are going to speak volumes right? You, you feel this feeling is believing you're bought in now. You're like, you're in this, you know it. You're like, I'm, I'm feeling as good as I felt in a long, long time. You don't need convincing anymore. You're just going to get healthier and healthier and healthier the longer you do this thing and let that health speak volumes. I've tried many, many times to reach close friends and family members. And I've always found that the more I push, the more they kind of pull away. And it's kind of like, unfortunately, I'm doing that because I care about them, right? You want your people to really listen 
but you've kind of just got to let them make their own mind up by watching how you just step into your version of radical health, letting your energy and your vitality and your confidence speak for themselves and then teasing them a little bit with, hey, you know, this is what I'm doing. They'll get curious. They'll start asking you questions. I mean, the fact that you're traveling to Indonesia with 15 bottles in your suitcase, I just hope customs are cool with you and you get through there because you're a hat and soil. You're a first uh, smuggler, I think. So that's amazing. Good job. And um, yeah, I would say as a generic kind of like, you can't go far wrong with beef organs. I, I, I'll hand it over to Dean in a second to see any other examples, but they seem to be the most broad spectrum, a little bit of everything in the most powerful stack. So again, keep living your radical health example, keep practicing what you preach and let people get curious. And if you want to, you know, if you want to slip people, a, a, you know, a bottle and say, hey, just try this, trust me, just try that. I think you can't go far wrong with beef organs, but I mean, we love every supplement. So obviously we're biased, but w <laughs> what else would you say? What else would you throw in there, Dean? Oh man, good question. And by the way, I love your enthusiasm. Yeah. I'm like on fire over here. I, oh, I love, I, I love it. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I feel that same about your team. I have to say, I've never, you know, you order products from a company and you try to get help or any kind of guidance. And it's very difficult. The inspiration and guidance that you can get from heart and soil, I mean, it, it, it's endless. Every time I've reached out and called, it's been really amazing to have that kind of a community because I jumped into this not knowing anything about what I was doing. And I just wanted to do it because of my son's results. And like there's certain things that showing up that show up for me that like all of a sudden just naturally losing weight and all of a sudden losing cravings. Like mm. I don't crave to eat anything during the day. And I'm a wine drinker. I love my wine for dinner. That has gone away too. Like very, I don't understand it, but I'm accepting it and pleased with all that, the results of that. But it, um, anyway, I'm just I'm so grateful for the, the kind of uh, support. From oh, I appreciate that. You know, we, uh, mm -hmm. we try to really care and we have a, a whole group of people here who, who do care and, and want to help and we'll go out of our way you know, to help. So if there's anything you need, just reach out. Thank you. It's, yeah. it, it's wonderful. And the one thing I wanted to say that I added on, it's difficult. And this is another question in Indonesia, really difficult because he's so isolated on mm. mental life, um, that to even get red meat, let alone grass fed meat or, you know, milk dairy really hard. So, you know, I, I, I brought all the same things. I always get him in the beef organs, mood and brain and, and gut and digestion. And then I added on uh, immunal milk this time. Mm. I was wondering if that just would have been a good, anyway, I, you know, that's what I have packed, but I was thinking that would be a good supplement to add. Great addition. To, Great addition because you've got the colostrum okay. there. And again, especially in the absence of good quality dairy, that's a really nice addition. It's a very unique compound to come across anyway, even, even for the lucky folks that can get the uh, you know raw dairy. So that colostrum is, I'm a big fan of that. It's one of my favorite supplements. I always throw in my own personal stacks. But Same. I just want to say, you, you know, you said he's in kind of a remote island. Firstly, I love Indonesia. That country is beautiful. I've spent accumulatively probably like six months of my life on various different trips there. So it's really cool. And I understand some of the challenges you're, you're, you're facing here. Indonesia for the longest time, huge exporter of coconuts. They used to cook everything in coconut oil. And now because that's become a hot commodity in the West, they ship it all out. And, you know, we pay, you know, three times the price over here in the US for that. And they go to the cheap seed oils. And I guess the good news about the, the chicken that you are going to get in those kinds of places and the eggs and the fish is, the chicken are not going to be fed, you know, this non-organic corn and soy feed. They're just out there, they're foraging, they're, you know, they're eating the bugs in the hills. The beef that you can get it, you know, luckily they're not using tons of, you know, feed again. It's just very natural. And I don't know whether your son has the ability to make smaller trips to Bali to stock up, but I actually uh, am aware of a company over in Bali. I'm not sure in relation to where they are, but usually travel through there or whatever. But there's a company called Hunter's. It's called Hunter's Bali. And I know the guy firsthand that runs it out there. He's called Dom. And they do a, actually, they, they do a meat subscription box in Bali that's lo working with the local farmers in Indonesia to find cattle that are raised the right way, put them into this. I believe they actually have a butcher store now as well. And they're working on cheese and all of that stuff too. So it's happening. Even in Indonesia, it's happening. So just keep that in mind and plant that seed when you see your son and, and have a safe trip out there and keep doing what you're doing. I mean, what a what an adventure. Bali and organs and you know healing. So best of luck to you, Lisa. Safe travels and enjoy that wonderful Balinese culture and sunshine. And uh, Dino, 
that's it for our callers, my friend. Uh, so good chat. Thank you for being on the show and thank you for everything that you're doing. Like to hear those calls, I think is another really powerful reminder. You know, the team get inundated with emails and testimonials, but to hear the the voices of real people that are saying like, hey, this is like you said, life-saving. It's changing things. Must feel pretty good, man. Oh, it feels great. And I think one of the most rewarding things to do sometimes is to pick up the phone and call. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, a customer of ours and I've made a couple of those calls and just to hear how somebody, you know, went from struggling to feeling great, whether it's knee pain, whether it's healing from postmortem, uh, not postmortem, uh, after pregnancy, yeah. you know, healing people's uh, bodies. It's just incredible to hear it. And it's why I wake up every morning. That's part it. of it. That's yeah. why we do it. That's yeah, why we love do it. it. Thank you, uh, callers, for calling in and sharing those stories. If you have an amazing story, call in, share it. Let us help you. We have amazing guests. We have everything that we're doing here is for you. We're trying to just give amazing information, spread this message, and reverse this tide of our declining health and get back to radical health. Any closing words or thoughts? I think we know where we should send people to find you. It's hot and soil, but anything that you want to add before we wrap this one up? Uh, the only thing I'd like to say is thank you to you, Steve. Um, couldn't be happier to partner with you on this journey for Radical Health Radio. And uh, just thank you to the the whole community out there, everybody listening. And like Steve said, g give us a call. If we can help, we're, we're happy to do it. We want to do it. And that's why we're here. Thank you, brother. Awesome. Yeehaw. You heard it. Let's stay radical, friends. We'll see you soon. Peace out. All right, friends, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Radical Health Radio. We got a fresh new podcast for you every Wednesday. If you enjoyed the show, consider liking, subscribing, reviewing, and rating us on your podcast platform. It helps to spread this message of radical health. We'll see you next week.